So today I've got a lot of slides to get through, so I'm going to go through some of them quite quick, some of them we're going to stop on and dwell on a little bit, and I'm going to cover a few things. So I'm going to talk to you about what it's like to work internationally, I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons we've learned on some really big mega sized projects, some real sort of three takeaways really, main lessons, and then the other thing I'm going to talk about is the IoT, the Internet of Things, and 5G, and how I think 5G and the Internet of Things are going to really change our job going forward. So hopefully I'm not going to trigger everyone, but I do plan to trigger some of you during this. Okay, is this working? It is working. So just a little bit about me. I'm the Director of Commissioning for AJB, and I'm also a TBE. I started my work career on the 1st of December 1980 as a trainee test and balance and engineer. So in my bones, I'm a tab guy. I have a blog. I blog every week for the last four years at buildingwhisperer.com, and I have a podcast. I host a podcast with uh, an engineer called Robert Bean. He's a distinguished ASHRAE lecturer, and we're trying to just highlight people who are doing great work in our business, because the problem with our business is the good people sometimes are hard to find. So if you're interested in that, please go to it. For me, this is self-therapy. This is how I stop myself going postal about some of the crazy stuff we have to deal with in our business. So AJB, we have about 160 now. We were 180. We have about 160 people full-time throughout the Middle East. Um, we work in a lot of places. I personally do a lot of work with the US Corps of Engineers. We do a lot of work with OBO. We do a lot of US embassies around the world. I thank you for building them. Keep me employed. Um, we also do a lot of work with other international firms. Um, we have offices all through the Middle East. We are in the AABC for, and ACG for a few reasons. One of them is marketing. It's a very strong marketing tool. And the other is we do a lot of work with American clients, and it's a requirement, right? That 160 employees, by the way, is not all TAB. TAB is a very significant part of our business. It's probably way more than 50%. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but we also do commissioning, barrier testing, smoke testing, HEPA filter testing, technical writing of our own and manuals. So that is the whole shebang. But test and balancing is a really big part of our business. I personally have worked in 21 countries in the last 39 years. That's not, I'm not confused in genius with good luck. That is just dumb luck of being in the right place at the right time and saying yes probably when I should have said no. But what it's done is, as I've got older, it's actually given me a skill that I didn't realize I had until recently, which is I understand different engineering cultures because I've experienced different engineering cultures. And some of those culture clashes can create real problems on jobs. Um, this accent is from London, England. 12 years ago, my family and I emigrated to Canada, and two of my kids are now Americans. So I care about these three flags. Um, and where I work, where I'm based in Dubai, all these cultures clash. So Dubai, there's a lot of there's culture nationally between different countries. So Britain and America, famously, you know, two countries separated by one language. There are culture differences. You call it an elevator, I call it a lift, et cetera, et cetera, right? This also manifests itself in engineering, in design for buildings, in terms of architecture and engineering, right? Where I work in the Middle East, and particularly in Dubai, the British influence is very strong. So there's a lot of British culture in engineering. But there's also European culture, American culture. All this clashes in the Middle East. So depending who you're working for and what job you're working on can result in different outcomes and different things you have to do and different hoops you have to jump through. Sorry, I'm going to get the clicker right. But tab, let's talk about tab, right? So it's not easy being a tab firm. If it is, you know, there'd be a lot more people would be doing this, right? So even in, on American jobs I bid, I do a lot of work with the Corps of Engineers, Middle East District. There is such confusion in commissioning and tab that even in their specs, they have to put a table in to differentiate and explain to people the differences between the different organizations. Right? Sorry, I'm going to get this right in a minute. And then we have specs and drawings that are incomplete. So Liam Neeson with a gun, always good, right? In my mind, he has a pito tube as well. But how many times have we had a set of drawings? They're incomplete. The schedule doesn't match the drawings. The drawings don't match the spec, right? These are all issues you have to deal with. And then when you have culture clashing around that, that gets even worse. 
So I did a bit of research a couple of years ago on my blog, and in the UK alone, there are 53 different commissioning codes. Right? Now, when I say the word commissioning, the Brits call tab commissioning. We're coming on to that. In the USA, two years ago, I counted 31 commissioning codes and guides. It's chaos out there, right? Is it any wonder the industry doesn't know what to do with us? When I was doing this research, in the US alone, there were 16 different commissioning certifications. If you want to be an engineer, you become a PE, right? If you want to be a commissioning authority, there are 16 choices. This is why the market's confused about us. So, this accent is British, right? Although I'm now a Canadian. The Brits call tests and balancing commissioning. So when you meet a British guy, and I do this still all the time, when I say commissioning, I actually mean test and balancing. There are two organizations in the UK, the Charter Institute of Building Services, they write commissioning codes. They are, they are the equivalent of ASHRAE, if you like. They tell you what to do, and then BISRIA, the Building Services Research and Information Association, they publish guides that tell you how to do it. That is a testing and balancing guide. This is the one for air systems. And humble brag, I wrote the VAV section on that one back in the day. That was in 1996. So for the first six years of my working life, I worked in the UK, and I was a commission engineer. But you would call me a tab guy. Then I got a job with an AEBC firm in Saudi Arabia called SITB. So I have this soft spot for AEBC, right? I go there, and I'm surrounded by Americans and American culture, and then I find out I'm not a commissioning guy, I'm a tab guy. <laughs> Shocker for me. Then there's systems and tolerances, right? So the other bit of research I did, I had to, because I deal with international clients, I had a client who was confused about what to specify. So they said, I'm going to write this tab spec. My tab spec is out of date. I want to update it. What do I specify? So you know, I'm 39 years in. I didn't even know off the top of my head what that answer was. So I did what all good consultants do. I just bombarded him with information. Right? So I went through all the British and the American standards. And every one of them was in business for itself, doing its own thing, different pluses and minuses. Right? So again, this is why the industry doesn't understand us very well. Maybe su subject for another day, we need to harmonize a bit more. But if you are a consultant or an owner, this is confusing information, right? It's too much coming at you. So there's that. We deal with that a lot in the Middle East. We have all these conflicting specs and guides. So as an ABC firm in the Middle East, I prefer it when I get an American spec because I know exactly what I've got to do. It's ABC specs, I do this, this is the output, right? But we don't always get that. Mostly when we work with American clients, we get that, but we do a lot of work with British clients and other clients. So the construction market in the Middle East, where I am based in Dubai, it's, it's like Disneyland for architects and engineers. You see buildings there, you just will not see anywhere else. And the worldwide construction industry for next year is $10.3 trillion. Compare that with the US at 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars. So there is a massive market out there. So conservatively, the addressable tab commissioning market has to be between one and five billion, depending on what percentage you believe tab work is a construction cost. That's an opportunity for everybody in here, right? But let's talk about issues, right? So everyone talks about climate change. I hate that word. It's the worst word in the world because it's so big, no one feels they can do anything about it, right? Energy is not the issue. Energy is a cost issue. There are substitutes. Gas, oil, nuclear, solar, right? That is a cost factor. Maybe water is the issue because there's no substitute for water. But actually, the real issue is people. Too many people chasing not enough stuff. God, I'm going to get this right in a minute. And too many people leads to mega cities. So the trend to the future are mega cities, right? So New York is pretty much the only Western city that is, gonna, is trending towards being a mega city. All the mega cities of the world will be in Asia, Africa. 
Now, mega cities mean mega projects, right? So what's a mega project? For me, a mega project is a construction budget of over a billion dollars. And there are many, many jobs like that today in the world. We've worked on a lot of them. This is an example of one. This is the one we worked on. But you know, that is not being built in London. That is not being built in America. That is being built in Asia. This is one I drove by last week in Dubai. That is a thing of beauty, by the way. That is signature architecture. That is a museum, right? So that's vanity architecture in a way. But that is a mega project. That is half built at the moment. And all the Arabic is legible if you speak Arabic. Am I right, Hussam? <laughs> but, sorry. This is a project. So when BJ came out to visit us in Dubai, I believe this is one of the projects you went to, right? This is not untypical. This is quite typical of what was going on in Dubai in the last 10, 20 years. You know, that is, we did the test and balancing on that, and that job took a year for us. And this is a job I just want to speak to you about. So we've, we're just wrapping up this project at the moment. So this is a new Abu Dhabi airport, midfield airport. So this is a $3 billion job. It's just massive at every level. You can see this sucker from space. It's just huge. If you go into this job, get out to the job site work face and forget your laptop, it takes you 45 minutes to go back and get that and then get back out there. It's that big, right? Commissioning this and doing a test and balance on this job was a real challenge, just for the size. And this job was really good for us in terms of consolidating some lessons learned and some best practices. So I have to give a shout out to Jonathan Lloyd of NEB here. You're competing against people who use emerging technologies better than you. You're competing against people who execute means and methods better than you. So what does that mean? We won the Abu Dhabi airport job based on a competitive bid. Right? That makes us a commodity. We are price takers. So most people in this room, unless you are like a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist, you set the price. If you're not doing that, you're a price taker. That means you have to take the price the market gives you right, through a competitive bid. So we're commodities. Like it or not, four years of college, blah, 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 you're a commodity. So what that means is to make money, there are still some firms that make money and consistently make money, and some firms that don't, and they struggle and they go up and down. right? And the difference is that how good you are at running your business, running your projects, how you use and adopt technology, how you use it to save money. If you, today's environment, I think, is very competitive. And unless you're forward thinking like this and perpetually tune in your machine, you will fall from regular profitability into an up and down spike. And when you do big projects, this whole thing gets magnified. So peep, we sell, what do we sell? Knowledge, expertise, and time, right? That's what we sell. And somehow the industry has commoditized that. But if, if I look at this, if you look to the left, that is how I was in the 80s. That's pretty much what I looked like. I used to turn up, I had an earring in, just come in, do a bit, go home. Then in the 90s and the early noughts, you know, things get a bit more serious. The industry matures. People start wanting you to be certified. You know, and then you start using better technology. And really what you've got to get to is the, the Navy SEAL level. You've got to get your team to a level of excellence where they're executing using the best methods, the best means, and the best technology. Because that's how you make money. So. There were three lessons learned from this airport job. So let me just set the scene for the airport job. This job is huge, right? And then just to give you an idea of the contractual chain, there's obviously an architect and a designer. And this is a lead job. So then the owner has a lead commission authority. And then there is another commissioning management firm below that who are checking and validating everything. And then below that, working for the main contractor, is another commissioning manager just organizing everything. Remember, commissioning and tab are interchangeable in this part of the world, right? Just organize everything. And then there's three, started off as three tab firms, of which we were one. So there's checkers, checking the checkers, checking the checkers, who check the checkers, right? So there is bureaucracy here. So not only is there distance, eating your time and money, 
this bureaucracy eating your time and money. So because the job was so huge, and there's only so much supply in the market, they divided it into three tab firms. After a month, the first tab firm went, you know what, I'm done, I'm out of here. Boom, they went. So there's one NEB firm, and there's us as the ABC firm. Because in this job, the specs call for certified testing and balancing. Now in the Middle East, what happens is, designers who are, and engineers who are not sure what they're doing, they specify everything, right? So if it's a mixture as an international design team, might have an American architect, a British engineer, just to make sure everything's covered, they specify NEB, ABC, all the British standards, all the European standards, all the local standards. And then you wind up with this huge bureaucracy. So you have to satisfy everything, right? So what that means is three things. We had three lessons learned here. We had, I think, on this job at peak 40 people full time. We've been working on this job for three years. We started doing the ductwork leakage testing, and then once that was finished, there was a bit of a gap, and we came back, and we've been doing all the testing and balancing ever since. The job is likely to complete January next year. That will be just over three years for us. So the lessons learned were this. The commissioning manager working for the main contractor really handled this well. They organized everything. So the first thing they required us to do was pro forma all the paperwork. Now, American firms are very good at this. American tab firms and commission firms are really good at doing pro forma reports, sending them in. And I believe that's because the submittal process in the US is very strict. In other parts of the world, it's not very strict. So you guys are good at that. But you'd be amazed at how many people just turn up with no paperwork ready, haven't looked at the schedules, they just arrive and start working. So number one, Pro forma all your paperwork. Do not go, if you're doing a big, complicated hospital job in Texas, say, do not go to that job unless you've gone through everything and have all that paperwork pro forma out, right? So I didn't bother doing a slide flex, it's paperwork, right? How boring is that? The next thing is managing people. So cleverly, the commissioning manager who was managing all the tab teams, he broke the jobs down system by system, and then they had two people sitting in a control room. Just as, you know, you see a Navy SEAL movie, right? There's two guys sitting there, they're in their fatigues and there's monitors everywhere and they're directing people out in the field. That's how this job was run. There were two people back in an office with screens all over the place. And then they had WhatsApp groups for each, like HU1, HU2, HU3, HU4, and they dispatched the commissioning and tab teams out and then directed their work, and then if there was a problem, there would be a FaceTime, and they would look at it, there'd be a direction given, and it would go. So if you are on a big job, I, I don't know what it's like in America. Outside America, everybody uses WhatsApp. Here, Apple are very strong, but you know, you, this could be FaceTime, it could be WhatsApp. WhatsApp's just powerful because everyone has it. There was zero cost in using WhatsApp here because everyone had WhatsApp, right? Um, but it was powerful because you, you didn't go out, you went out with intention, you went out to the right work face that you knew was available, work got done, if there was a problem, there was a resolution, like boom, pretty much instantaneously. And that is how that job got done. So lesson number two is supervision with instantaneous communications. And 5G will really help that. The other one is how big should your team be? How, how big can it get before you can effectively manage it or not manage it? So there's a management theory called spanner control. Spanner control basically says there is a, an optimum size between small and large that you can effectively manage people and add value, right? So spanner control we found was when you got more than two or three people, you got up to four people working on a system, that needed a supervisor and then someone else managing the paperwork. And then the maximum span of control for that supervisor we found was eight people, plus someone doing the paperwork. When that went over eight, you had to subdivide again. So again, that's about effective control, right? And the other problem with our business is this. It's a massive job. When we were bidding that job, we used to, we were having these post-bid meetings. It was always, oh, this is a big job. What's the discount? When you are selling knowledge, expertise, and people, you can't give a discount. There's actually an overhead to a big job, which is those supervisors were productive, but they weren't 100% utilized. They were maybe 50% utilized, and the other 50% was making sure the other guys were 100% utilized, right? 
So there's all like an inverse economy of scale. When you sell knowledge workers, you have to add in cost for supervision on big jobs. It's very hard to do that when you're commoditized, right? So those are the three lessons. One, always do, the, do not go to that site unless you've got the paperwork done, all the RFIs raised, and you know you can start immediately. Two, use technology, WhatsApp or FaceTime or something, but manage people centrally if possible, if it's a big job. And three, be aware that team management is that that was the crucial issue in terms of being effective or not, how those people were supervised on the ground. So the projects out there, we've, most of our projects are large. They are year six months is a small project, but it's normally year two, year three years, right? And that takes the management overhead that you've got to provide. But I would argue that those three things you could apply to any, certainly any complicated hospital job, lab job, or any job where you've got more than three or four techs on it. So let's talk about, sorry, let's get some water. I want to talk about now where, where I believe our industry is going. I'm a big fan of looking forward, right? So there were lessons learned from the BlackBerry. Anybody got a BlackBerry here? No. Anybody been to Tower Records lately? No. Anyone been to Blockbuster lately? No. Right? So things change. So the people running those businesses decided that they were so awesome, things weren't going to change for them, and they did. Construction, in terms of design and construction of buildings, our industry has been very, I believe, very resistant to change. The things I'm doing today, if I'm on the tools, are the same things I was doing in 1980. I'm running around with a hood, an anemometer, right? I believe that is going to change because there are a few things coming to fruition. Now, let's talk about paper quickly. What has changed? So, on your last job, were the O&M manuals issued in paper form? Yes or no? Anybody? Yeah. Why are we still doing paper when we all have iPhones, right? So let's just talk about the context a little bit. When I started, I came into the business in 1980. That was the back end of the oil crisis. So in London then, if you were selling an oil-fired boiler, you were going out of business, right? Because the building regs, the building codes were all being changed. Famously in America, that pushed ventilation rates down. And that led to the rise of building certification. So I'm a big fan. This is the S-curve theory, right? You have the early adopters, it rises up, and it tails off, and then a new trend takes over. So the oil crisis drove building performance and design. Then came green building certifications. So just FYI, I think last time I looked, there were 600 different building certifications in the world. LEED is one of the most well-known, but actually the most prominent is um, Brienne from the UK, but because it's Brits and they don't know how to promote themselves, no one knows. It's the best kept secret in the world. But I believe this green building certification is flattening out. When LEED went to version 4 the other year, enrollment in that scheme dropped 74% and hasn't picked up since. So if your business is LEED commissioning, you need to evolve, right? Now, lead commissioning is, I have a love-hate relationship with it. It's great because it sort of raised the profile of commissioning, and it's bad because people think that's what commission is, and it's not, right? And then where does the tab guy fit in that? The tab guy is in there somewhere, in my opinion. So I believe that green building certifications are tailing off. That whole phenomenon is going to slowly die away, and what's going to take its place is owners demand in performance because owners are going to have visibility on what works and doesn't work based on IoT and the killer is going to be 5G making that really available. So owners in the past that used to go, oh, build me a building, design me a building and I'll come and do it and then not really care about it, that, that's going to change. Owners are going to have visibility. So technology is going to enable them to measure and verify everything, analyze it, feed it back in, and they're going to work out who's giving value and who's not. Who can swim and who's not swimming, right? So that's, let's look at that in the terms of organizations. So I'm old, right? I saw some of this history. 
So in the early days, air conditioning systems would just turn on and walk away. And in many places I worked, that is still the strategy. Then organizations emerged, right, to try and bring some order to that chaos. ABC, NEB, in the UK, SIBSI addressed it, then there's TABB. And then commissioning became a thing, right? Now, again, confusing to me as a Brit because I thought I was doing commissioning when I was doing TAB. But commissioning comes in, and really for me in the North America, ASHRAE Guideline Zero was where that really kicked in and where ASHRAE got hold of it. And we have commissioning organizations now, 16 in North America, amazingly enough. But really the main ones are ACG, NEB, ASHRAE. I'm not even sure I count ASHRAE, but ACG and NEB. And now, again, I believe that is an S-curve that is flattening out. And I believe commissioning has evolved into something else, and that's what I want to talk about. So, like this guy. That is the best definition of commissioning I've ever found. The Russian proverb, trust but verify. I trust you to design it, I trust you to build it, and I'm going to hire this tab firm and this commission firm to test it and tell me it works. Right? Donald Trump, 0.5, I like that guy. And the other thing, which is going back to some of the presentations yesterday, right? Whatever way you cut it, a heating system, a chill water system, a VAV system, the performance of that system comes down to probably a two or three hundred dollar piece of kit, right? That VAV system depends on that differential pressure sensor being located, right? The tab firm working out empirically what the optimum set point for that is, coordinating with the controls guy and getting that put in, right? So all the assumptions in design and the energy model are based on that whole thing happening flawlessly all the way through. How many times does that happen in your experience? Well, right? Have you ever tried to give that information to the controls guy and have him excited about it? Oh, no, it doesn't happen, right? Same with heating systems, same with your water systems. There's a DP switch or there's a temperature sensor somewhere, right? So is commissioning and test and balancing going away? No, because that empirical testing is necessary to get these systems working optimally because every engineering model and design is based on that assumption. But again, I believe our business is going to evolve. So anybody, what is that? $10. Right. Agreed, it's an energy valve. Let me just take a quick slug out. Do you know what it also is? That is a data acquisition machine. So I saw this at a Belimo presentation earlier in the year. This really changed my thinking. So Belimo, sell that gadget, right? It's a control valve, it's a commissioning valve. It measures so supply and return temperature, so it can calculate BTUs in real time. Right? It can connect to the internet. It stores data, it uploads data. It's a data acquisition machine, right? So does that need a test and balance guy to work on it? Anyone? Why? Someone tell me why. Verification, right. All right. So what happens if the market evolves to a point where the trust and accuracy of these machines is a given? And the cost of applying that accuracy in the terms of IoT sensors falls to cents on the dollar? Because that's where it's going. Right. And again, I'm not saying test and balancing is going away here. I'm saying the nature of it is going to change. So when I first saw that, I thought, yeah, who's doing that? Well, you go to Belimo's website. They're selling this right now. Today, anybody, any of your clients can go to Belimo, buy this equipment, put it on. This is a snapshot from their website. They are promoting their products now as IoT products. So this plays into what people are calling the fourth industrial revolution, right? I believe buildings are going to play into this fundamentally. So everyone seen this thing before? So currently in construction, I think we have what's 
it's the wild west of software. Everybody's, everybody I've spoken to here, I've met here over the last few days, is either using a software product or has their own in-house software product. There are data, a lot of the products like Dwyer have a data collection aspect to them, right? So everybody's got something going on digitally, right? At some point in the future, that is going to have to consolidate. And we're going to be part of that and how we use that data. So there's a lot of talk about technology impacting construction. At the moment, frankly, I haven't seen it. But it's coming, right? So why is now an important moment? Well, this is why I think it's an important moment. There are, some, there are many factors come into play. One is baby boomers are retiring. I'm 56. I've sold three companies. I'm on my last run here, right? 60, I'm out. Half the people in this room are probably in that game, right? The presentation we just had was all about that game. So there is a massive skill shortage building in our business at the moment, in our industry. And that's at all levels, not just tab commissioning. That's also at design, construction. You ever try, have you ever tried to get a plumber or a bricklayer to come to your house? Jesus Christ, I've got more chance of getting the Queen of England coming to my house where I live. <laughs> so that's one force that's really going to be powerful on it. The other thing is the technology. Technology always overpromises and underdelivers, but it's actually starting to happen. And 5G is going to be a big part of that. So at the moment, there's a lot of talk about the Internet of Things. Blimo are on that bus. Many other firms are on that bus. That bus is going down a road and it's picking up speed. Right? And then when you pile on 5G to that, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that makes that Internet of Things a lot more scalable and usable and user-friendly. So people leaving, skill shortage, technology, it's going to change things. And also there's a bit of over-complexity, right? I can give you a whole two-hour seminar where you should never put in a VAV system. It's just too complex and never works. So there's going to, one, the other market reaction is going to be systems are going to simplify. DOAS with radiant, DOAS for correct outside air with radiant heating and cooling. There's nothing wrong with that. Other than in Canada and America, no one wants to do it. The supply chain drives design decisions in North America at the moment. The supply chain is geared up for air systems. That, again, I, I believe that will change. So let's talk about 5G. Why is 5G important? So Internet of Things, in my opinion, is out there. Train has left the station. It's picking up speed. The killer change is going to happen is this. So at the moment, we're on 4G, right? We can all watch Netflix. I can watch it on my phone. Wherever I go in the world, I can open a Revit drawing or a CAD drawing and work on it. It's awesome. With 5G, that speed is going to go up exponentially. So when I was researching for this, there were a lot of promises. But conservatively, it's going to be 10 to 12 times faster than 4G. One of the interesting stats I saw was a two gigabyte movie will come down to your phone in under five seconds. But crucially, there are some differences with 5G. So 5G has trouble, because of where it sits on the spectrum, it has trouble transmitting over distance. So what you're going to wind up with is lots of 5G clusters. I think the first one in North America is in Rhode Island, of all places. I don't know why. Maybe because it was easy, because it was smaller. Um, but what that means is buildings will lend themselves easily to becoming a 5G cluster. So what you're going to wind up is lots of transmitters and repeaters everywhere. But the other thing with 5G is there's five, if, you, if you put a valve in, it can interface with the internet without going for a router if you've got 5G. There's a lot less router issues, cable issues, setup issues. So you could literally, if you have 5G on your site, you buy a valve, boom, plug and play. That thing can start sending data the minute it's there. Right. Now that's another whole discussion about data security and who owns it, right? But 5G, mark my words, is a game changer. Now, North America and Europe actually are behind on this. Where I am in Dubai, I can buy a 5G phone, and 5G nodes are popping up right now. They see that as a way of getting an advantage, right? A business advantage. Because in today's world, data and speed and access is really the, the differentiator. So in North America, I think 5G phones are, start, are going to be on sale next year. And I think Apple are talking about two years down the road. But that's going to be a year or two behind other parts of the world. And I think that's going to be a problem. But what you should take away from this is it's the latency, or lack of, 
and the speed is going to change things. So just a few slides on stats. In the coming years, 40% of total data created will be from sensors. That's an IoT thing. 50 billion devices by next year, that will go up exponentially. So the possibilities include having immediate control, boosting productivity, isolating issues, saving costs. All them things are things that building owners want. Building owners want control, efficiency, cost control, information, right? Do they know what to do with that at the moment? No. Will they know in the future? They will hire people that do. So going back to my friend Jonathan, yeah, the design firms, the construction firms, the tab firms, the commissioning firms that get on board with this and find a way to make it work to their advantage are going to win. And the firms that are in the tower records mode are just going to slowly fade away. This isn't going to be an overnight thing. It took 10 years for cars to displace horses. And I think 10 years is probably the right, the right time span here, right? So if you're, you know, if you're my age, if your age begins with a five, you're good. Keep doing what you're doing, ride that sucker out to the end. It's all good. But if you're young in your career and your age begins with a three or even a four, you are going to see, I believe, some very significant change so that change is probably going to look like it's first going to manifest itself in the instrumentation you use. And then it's going to come in how you apply that, right? So can you do things faster, quicker, offline, right? Can you provide tablets to your staff so that there's no double handling of data? So in the bad old days, right, I go to site, I fill in my thing, send it to the office, someone does it, they print it out, send it to the other guy, he stamps it, right? Why is that not an online process with single handling? It can be, as of today. That is an advantage, right, in efficiency. So if you're selling time, anything that saves you time is money in your pocket. So Morpheus, the god of dreams, right, and a seriously cool dude. What does it mean for us? Now, now this is my personal belief, right, and it's easy for me to say because I'm riding it out to retirement here. I'm looking at you because you're young. <laughs> so, right, I believe your job will morph into the center of that Venn diagram. So tab, commissioning, and controls, they're all going to morph into a single job. Maybe 10, over 10 years at the earliest, 20 years for sure, in my opinion. And this is what it comes to. So if I'm you, young, all with my hair, looking good, I would be thinking about what skills do I need to acquire now to be ready for that, right? So at the moment, test and balance engineer needs to have technical education, pass a tough eight hour exam. We all agree that was tough, right? And experience, because the exam is very good at weeding out people who don't have experience. That's what you need today. I believe in the future, data, is going to become key to your job. So let's go back to the Bulimo example, right? Let's say you've got to a job, all the control valves are spewing out data, all the VAV boxes are spewing out data, right? That data is going to be collected and analysed. And in the future, a tab guy will go into a BMS room, let's say he's setting up a VAV system, and he will get real-time information as to what that box is doing, BTUs, airflow, everything. And he will write some algorithms and set them in play and he will simulate it. If it works, he'll let that simulation go into the system, you'll be done. And there might be some readings to verify it. So initially, that would be write the algorithm, test it, set it out, and then go out and measure it. And over time, that will probably, the measurement part will probably go away as trust in the sensors builds. So, I have a side gig I, through my website advising young engineers on career. Like, should I do a master's in engineering? The answer is always no, by the way. You should never do that. If you, if, you get, if you need a bachelor's to be a peer, you do not need a master's degree, ever. Do it in something else. But I have a side gig adv advising uh, young people in their career. So my advice to them is always do, do courses in data analysis and data analytics. Right? Learn to write algorithms. Learn soft skills. Those are going to be the killer skills that are going to make the difference. 
The future TBE, 20 years from now standing here, will be able to write algorithms, will understand data analytics, and will have awesome soft skills, I presenting. You know, like the guy before me, sucked all the air out of the room, right? So these are the things I believe you should add. Writing skills, for God's sake, do a writing course. Be able to write a memo that doesn't upset the contractor. So the first reactions to this are never good. Luckily, you guys have been pretty, <laughs> pretty good with this. Sometimes I get super bad feedback on this. Um, but this is the thing. We are, this is what I believe your job's going to look like in the future. You'll be sitting on a screen like that. You'll be writing algorithms. Then you'll go out and do some testing just to make sure it's all good. Then over time, you'll stop doing that. So what that, does that mean for T, TBEs and for tab firms? What it probably means is the future TBE will be a very high value person. And what I mean by that is they'll be very highly skilled. It won't be something you can do like straight out of university. It'll be something as it is now where you need the technical education then you need to build your experience and your other skills, right? And then let's say you're nine or 10 years into your career. At that point, assuming you've survived, you're going to be a very valuable, highly skilled professional. And I believe you'll be paid well for that. So what it's probably going to create, I think, is a strata of super sort of like high level TBEs. And then there will be maybe some assistants sort of who will go do some of the verification. And in the middle, there'll be nothing. Hollow out the middle class, right? It's a bit like that. That person though, will have a great job and will earn a lot of money, I believe. Anybody know a poor TBE? I've not met one. <laughs> they do all right, right? I think in the future they could do even better, but there's gonna be less of them. It's gonna become a, a more elite group, more of a Navy SEAL group. Does anybody here get involved in writing algorithms or doing any data analysis? Or any interaction with controls people? No? Hey, this one, awesome. You're that guy. <laughs> so what do you do? Do, do, how, how, do? do you write algorithms and you test them in the field? Yeah. And what, was, what drove that? Was that a client request or was that a... That was playing and programming actually. Just wanting to get some data and put in place. Yeah, because you actually wanted it to work, right? <laughs> yeah, call me old fashioned, but... Okay. Yeah, so I asked, sorry about that. I asked, um, has anyone here done any data analytics or algorithm writing as part of their testing and commissioning on systems? And the answer was one person, our future TBE over here. And it was driven by a client request because things just weren't working and it needed that extra, that extra bit, right? Because when you think about it, why is there a business called testing and balancing and commissioning? There isn't a testing and balancing and commissioning engineer for cars. They work, right? Turn them on, it's all good. How many defects in a car? Zero. Laptops. That laptop works right. All the embedded technology works in it. So why are there commissioning people and testing and balancing people? Because the design process and the construction process doesn't deliver things that work. You still need that tuning, that testing, that tweaking, right, to get it where it should be before you hand it over. So the technology that is coming on board now, I think, is going to make buildings a lot more like cars in that their delivery will be a lot more consistent and their systems will be a lot more operational and they will perform with a persistence of performance. Because the holy grail for a building services design is persistence of performance, right? So when I used to advise as a sustainability advisor, I would always say the best thing you could put in your building is a triple glazed window. Doesn't look sexy, it's not a windmill on your roof, there's no virtue signaling, signaling with it, but the persistence of performance is always there, right? Straight line. Put in a VAV system, the performance goes like this. So persistence of performance is gonna be one of the things that's gonna be delivered, I think, by technology. So I'm coming up on my time, and I'm conscious, yeah, I'm a little bit over time, so let me, oh, <laughs> my logo's gone. Can I take some questions? I'll leave that up there. 
Who wants to go on a data analytics course? Anyone? <laughs> Any questions? Look, I'm a narcissist. If you don't ask me a question, I'm going to take it that you all agree. <laughs> in audits and things right now. Yeah. There's a lot and in jumping into new markets that we have. It's very optimistic, a lot of that. But a lot of, I mean, there's a lot that's still dragging. Mm -hmm. Dragging. Yeah. Like 10 years seems like very optimistic. Um, I, I mean, lead is tailing off. I don't even see lead functioning <laughs> in any kind of capacity uh -huh. most of the time. It's a paper. And yeah, it's lead signed is over. And it's stamped, but... But our, our analysis and performance testing show just things not working, whether yeah. it's leakage or construction, and it's a million other pieces of the, of the pie there that have to. So that was interesting, that point you set on there. Your analysis was providing evidence that things don't work, right? A thousand percent. Yeah. Increasing outside air, yeah. and decreasing performance. So as the cost of knowing that, as the cost of equipment, IoT equipment comes down and speeds increase with 5G, that evidence is going to be available in real time without them paying you to go and get it, right? Yeah, it's available real time right now. Yeah. I have a summary with pictures and arrows and glossy photographs. Yeah. And if nobody understands it. Yeah. So your job might evolve into being a translator of that, right? You'll receive that information. Yeah. And you'll provide the an analysis. Because that analysis, being a computer nerd isn't enough. You've got to be an applied, you've got to have applied engineering knowledge, right? Right. You've got to know how a system works, how it interacts with other systems, how it interacts with the building facade. That's the killer skill. That's where that TB of the future, who's got right. all that in there, will receive that information. And maybe that person would be hired by the owner to take that information in and say, yeah, that works, that doesn't work. Fire that guy because he can't get that right. You know, there's... Right. But what is coming is a tsunami of real-time information the money in the early days is going to be in who can interpret that and turn it yeah. into value, right? Yeah, that's the key. And then when that interpretation is given to owners, that is going to turn into bullets they're going to shoot people with who don't do their job. So the days of rule of thumb design, you know, if most design engineers are honest, they're still using rules of thumbs and Excel spreadsheets, right? Right. Just and, and not even that. If not right. even that. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. I didn't want to be the bad guy. <laughs> And that will slowly go away because it will be based on real feedback, real anal analytics. You know, there is, as data accumulates, it will be packaged and sold. I believe it will be packaged and sold, and the Belimo are already on this. They're collecting this data. I believe people like Belimo are going to turn around and say, ah, do you want to know, uh, you know, you're designing a student accommodation. Do you want to know when they all have a shower? Do you want to know when they all go to bed? Yeah. Because this will be in that data analytics, right? Well, I've uh, got three Belimo valves last year that came out of the factory with the wrong CV. The sticker yeah. was right, but the internal was wrong. So yeah. you can take those all you want, but if, if it's a Friday-made valve, it's going to be a piece of crap. Oh, yeah, yeah, Unless absolutely. somebody's there for us to verify. There is, there is going to be time, but the, just the, the real-time information of knowing when people use things, because most people go to the ASHRAE book, right? I'm doing a student accommodation. Yeah. I allow this, I allow this, I allow that. And what is built into that is loads of extra safety factors, right? Because you don't get sued. You know, if you sue an engineer, the first thing they do is pull up the ASHRAE guides. Mm -hmm. I've done this, right? But in the future, I believe right-sizing will become fashionable because it will be a way of saving cost. And that right-sizing will be based on analytics. And those analytics will probably be interpreted by a TBE. Sorry, I've overran. I'm sorry about that. Anyone? Okay. All right then. Thank you very much. <laughs>